FOMC decision yesterday evening, later today is the ECB decision, a lot's going on, a lot to talk about. Welcome to our view, the live stream. It's live, so you can ask questions uh, by using the chat function. And uh, my name is Felix Prill. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of VP Bank. Now, the Fed yesterday evening announced the long-awaited pause in their interest rate hike cycle. So after 10 hikes in a row, bringing the uh, Fed funds rate from basically zero to 5% in a bit more than one year, the Fed finally said, well, now it's time to take a, a pause to assess the impact of uh, the previous rate hikes uh, on the labor market, on inflation. Um, so that was widely expected, but at the same time, markets were a bit surprised that the, F uh, the Fed also uh, signaled that more rate hike hikes might come down the road uh, based on the dot plot, two more rate hikes later this year. Of course, that's not a given. Things can change uh, depending on incoming data, and I think that is something to look out for for the next coming weeks and month. Now, on the positive side, what happened in the recent weeks, uh, what we've seen is that uh, there was a bit of a return to, um, to a bit more risk for be better sentiment in markets. Um, that is reflected if you're looking on the left-hand side on the chart on the uh, risk appetite indicator, which is calculated by Goldman Sachs. We used to look at that indicator now for, for many years now already. And I, I think it's a reliable indicator as long um, whenever it, it, it gets in, into extreme um, situations. So basically, if it's really high, meaning a lot of risk appetite, maybe then a bit too much risk appetite, which would, could cause a, a setback, or if it's very low, meaning that everyone is scared, and then this could be a good um, a case to get a bit more uh, a risk, uh, um, a risk on again. Now, it is not at extreme levels yet, but what we clearly see is that um, uh, the risk appetite increased in markets, re basically reflecting that we have seen a positive development in stock markets. Now, if we look a bit more in detail um, beyond basically the surface at the stock market development in recent weeks, we see that it was not a kind of a broad-based improvement in stock markets, especially in the US. Um, this was very much driven by a few big stocks like Apple, for instance, and you might have read the news, um, Apple has now a market cap that is higher than the total market cap of all companies in the Russell 2000 index. That is um, shown on the right-hand side on that chart. The two lines show uh, the development of the market cap on the one hand side, basically for Apple, on the other hand, of all these 2000 companies. And that is very interesting because it shows how big, basically, big companies are now getting. And this is also kind of um, uh, um, um, uh, synonym, basically, what happened in the rest of, of, of the stock market. So it was not just Apple, but it was kind of only Apple. So it was more some of these other FANG stocks, so previous uh, Facebook, so Meta or Alphabet for, for Google. Uh, Microsoft is doing very well, very much driven by the recent AI hype. But beyond, looking beyond that, uh, be looking beyond the few big companies, we don't see a lot of positive development. Actually, if you look, for instance, at the S&P 500, and not at, uh, in, in a usual way, when you look at it at, as a market cap weighted way, as, it, as this index is constructed, but if you, if you look just at the 500 stocks included in that index and weight them equally, so Apple has the same weight like Microsoft and, and all the other the smaller stocks. Then since the beginning of the year, we would have seen not an um, increase of more than 10%, but a sideways movement. So there is not really a broad-based recovery in, in the US stock market. It comes down to a few companies. And actually, um, that might not be so surprising if you look what's gonna, gonna, uh, is going on in the overall economy. You see that on the next slide here on that chart, which shows you the business optimism among small companies based on a survey conducted uh, regularly and for, for many years now. And um, the chart is easy to read. The lower the line, the lower the optimism, the higher the line, the higher the optimism. And currently, it's very low. And whenever it was that low, actually, we have seen a recession in the past. That is indicated by the, by the um, shaded area, by the bars. And just looking at that chart, 
become, becomes quite of obvious why uh, we have to expect a recession. Um, and there are many more reasons for that, because that, um, that lack of optimism among companies in the US is not like coming out of thin air. It's very much kind of supported by a lot of challenges for these companies. So what we currently see is a credit crunch in the making. We see still regional banks in the US facing a lot of um, uh, uncertainty, um, lack of trust. They don't want to uh, risk to get in the in the limelight, uh, like Silicon Valley Bank. So they become, became much more um, cautious, much more restrictive in terms of their um, policy, um, business policy, <coughs> business practice. So, for instance, they uh, become um, they tighten their uh, credit lending standards, and that is not like kind of anecdotal evidence. Um, that's also um, based. You can can um, base that also on a survey conducted by the Federal Reserve, um, which is done quarterly. And in the last quarter, almost 50% of the senior um, loan officers said, actually, we have tightened our credit standards compared to the previous quarter. And whenever that happened, um, the U.S. economy um, declined by one or two percent, meaning a recession. And so you see m many of these indicators really pointing all in one direction, namely a recession. And because of that, we think all the talk about a soft landing is premature. Um, it shows a bit of a complacency, a bit of more hope than, than reality. And we don't buy into that. We think uh, this is not a time to chase that optimism, to chase another lack of that um, uh, um, positive development of f a few big companies. We think it, now it's the time to be cautious um, and not being surprised if, if market sentiment turns sour. And that's the reason why we underweight in equities, continue to be underweight. We are not only underweight in US equities, but we also underweight in Europe, um, where we actually have already entered a recession and it's not over there yet either, uh, because also the ECB has to do a bit more and with that also pre um, uh, slowing down the economy even further. Uh, we also underweight in, in Switzerland, and Swiss uh, franc portfolios because um, the Swiss economy is a small open economy and with that also the companies in the Swiss stock market are very much dependent on what is going on in the rest of the world uh, and on financial markets. So cautiousness with regard to equities. At the, on the other hand, that's the positive news after the increase in interest rates we've seen over the last two years. Now, um, bonds are looking much more um, interesting. So we are, we are overweight bonds. We are, as we discussed in previous occasions, overweight emerging market bonds. But we are also, depending a bit on the, on, on, on the currency, overweight government bonds. We are not, as, but what is shown here, overweight in Swiss bonds because the interest rate level is, in our view, a bit too low. But if you look at euro or dollar, we are overweight government bonds vis-a-vis -vis corporate bonds because corporate bonds is kind of the same like equities from a, from a risk point of view if you face uh, recession. So we expect clearly a recession. We expect more kind of a, we'd call it a hard landing and not a soft landing. And for that, we don't want to have as much risk in the portfolio as usual. Now, what you then could argue, and I heard many times is, well, but you know, if the Fed paused now and, and it will come to the rescue if things really deteriorate, right? If the economy slows too much, the Fed will come to the rescue. Uh, like what, what happened over the last 15, 20 years, whenever something went sour, the central banks came to the rescue, cut rates, added an, another lack of liquidity, and that was a big stimulus then for risky assets. Of course, that could happen, but something changed fundamentally compared to the last 15, 20 years, and that is inflation. It is still not over yet. We, it's ha great to see that we've seen that this week that um, U.S. inflation in May came down to 4%. Headline inflation, it was at almost 5% the month before. We've seen 9.1% uh, inflation as a peak last year in July. So clearly inflation is coming down, headline inflation. But the underlying inflation pressure is still there core inflation is still running at 5%. We're seeing that here on that slide. You see on the left-hand side the headline inflation rates for the US and the Eurozone. You see that positive trend that inflation rates are coming down. But on the right-hand side, you see that core inflation, the underlying price pressure, where you 
take out energy prices, where you take out some food prices, is still at around 5%, and with that, much higher than the target of the ECB and the target of the Fed of 2%. And that is the main difference to the last 20 years, where we've never seen that such a situation where core inflation is as high uh, when we enter a recession. And that limits the room to maneuver for central banks, and that explains why the Fed yesterday tried to convey not only the message now we pause and we evaluate things, but at the, on the other hand also trying to convey the message um, we are ready to do more because inflation is not over yet. And what I've heard many times in the last year that is kind of, kind of um, reducing the inflation problem basically to the war in Ukraine. We all remember that energy prices went through the roof after Russia invaded Ukraine. But if you look at these charts, that is not the reason for inflation. It was added a bit more inflation pressure in the short run. But if you look on the left-hand side, uh, once again at, the, at headline inflation, and you know, like the war started end of February 2022, if you try to, to draw a vertical line there, and look where inflation back then was. It was at around, it was beyond, uh, above 8% in the US and almost 8% in Europe. Inflation started way earlier to increase than the war started. So it's more to that. It's still coming down to the pandemic. It's coming down to the lockdowns where we could, we are not able to spend money. And at the same time, we got a lot of money from the governments. We were kind of forced to save money. And we were willing to spend that money now since then, and we still do, if you look at uh, what's going on in southern Europe, in Portugal, in Spain, in Italy, it's very hard to get any hotel, it's very hard to get flights, it's very expensive, and that drives inflation. And so basically the, the, the flip side is, only because energy prices come down, this doesn't mean that it might be over. Okay. Now you could argue, well, but even the Fed says, given that their projection forecast, we've, we've, they were released yesterday evening, that we, we will go back to 2% in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so basically, of course, we are not there yet, but we are going down. That clearly shows the forecast by inflation, uh, the, the inflation forecast. So the question is, should we trust that forecast? So we try to do another fact check. And we looked at a real-life example of, in this case, the Swiss National Bank, because uh, they're very transparent about their forecasts. Uh, they publish each and every quarter after, or with, with their monetary policy assessment, their new inflation forecast for the next three years, and not just the average number for the next year or the next two years or next three years, but also they forecast the path of that. So we have the data and it's publicly available. So what we did basically on that chart, it's the spaghetti lines, we, we, we show all these forecasts since 2005, so many forecasts, and we compared that to what happened. What happened to inflation? That's a dark blue line. And you see there's a mismatch, right? It's not that often that inflation forecast hit uh, uh, actual inflation. It's more miss than hit. And if I mean, that is at the core of the monetary policy concept of the S&P, to steer their monetary policy decisions based on their forecast. And they don't get it right most of the time. So if they don't get it right, why should someone else get it really right? Should we really re rely on, on these inflation forecasts? So we don't do it. We don't base our... Uh, investment tactic, tactical allocation or strategy on a, on a specific inflation forecast. And I hope you don't do that either. So that doesn't mean, however, and that's the positive news, that we don't know anything at all about inflation in the future. We can still form some expectation. We can still learn from the past and we, without having to rely on some model forecast of inflation that's most likely not going to um, play out as expected. Now, and we do that and, and that's the third observation and fact checking and the question a bit uh, uh, related to that. Even if we don't know exactly when inflation comes down to 2%, at some point it might come down to 2% and then it's finally over, then we can relax, then we can sit back because it stays there. 
right? That's the hope a bit, what we see in markets. But fact-checking, if you're looking at the past, that was not often the case either, right? And what we see on that chart here, that is inflation in the US since the 1960s, so more than 60 years uh, of headline and core inflation. Um, what kind of one pattern you can depict from that is inflation comes and goes in waves. There can be big waves, like in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, there can be smaller waves, uh, even in a, f in a trend where inflation fall uh, over the last 30 years. But very like often it, it fluctuates around that underlying trend. So even though that we don't know exactly when inflation will be back at 2%, even though um, we, um, we, we don't know exactly how that pass is going to look like, there are two things we, I think we can almost be sure. It's most likely not going down to 2% and going to stay there forever. Rather, we have to expect from the past as well that there will be some kind of uh, waving effect again. Because that is the nature of the beast. If you, if you shock that system so much as we have seen last year or last two years with inflation, that takes time to get out of the system. It's like a pendulum. It swings and it swings a bit lower, then it swings a bit more again if you, if, you, if you shock it. And this is something I think we have to expect. And this is the reason why we decided to, to, to um, take, um, go for inflation as the main uh, theme for new investment magazine telescope that will be published next Monday on June 19th. Um, in, in this investment magazine telescope, we usually try to identify topics uh, that um, will be relevant not just for the next three weeks or next three months, but rather for the next three years. And we still think, even though inflation pressure in the short term might come down, the overall topic of inflation will stay with us. And that has a lot of implications, not only for our daily life, but it has also very, very much implications uh, for uh, our portfolios. And um, we think there's a lot to, to discuss about, to look at it. We did that in our magazine. The title is Less for More, so you get less uh, and have to, pr to, to pay more for that. That's the nature of the beast, because even if inflation comes down as recently to 4%, that's still at a rate of change. 4% still means that prices are 4% higher than last year. And that is something we have to deal with. Um, in, in short, there's not one simple answer to it, but there are some better things you can do in a portfolio and some things that are, don't work as much. I can offer you to, to sit together with my colleagues and look at your situation. We are doing that, of course, in our investment committee as well. And I'm, I'm happy to, to share any, any thoughts with you, any feedback you might have. Please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to discuss that with you. I can promise you one thing. You don't get less in the, in the magazine, you get even more than usual. Um, with that, I would like to stop here for, for my view for the moment and, and glance on to the right-hand side and see if there are any questions um, that came in. Now I see three already, um, going to the, to the first one. Shouldn't I sell all my stock or all stocks as we are heading for a recession? What do you think? Um, yeah, you could do that. If, and that's a big if, if you know exactly how it's going to play out. If you exactly know when the recession starts, but if you exactly know when market sentiment turns sour, if you exactly then also know um, when things um, stop getting worse and starting to improve to re-enter the market. A lot of ifs in one sentence, and that is typically something to be, <laughs> uh, be reluctant, uh, like uh, you should be alert, uh, maybe that this is not the best idea. Because um, the nature of the beast is we are not really good in market timing. I, I don't mean just me um, um, or my team uh, or VP Bank or, you know, like it's, it's, it's everyone basically. Market timing is really difficult and, uh, and, and I don't think it's, it's wise basically to try to do that in extreme levels. So basically selling everything and then buying everything again our investment philosophy is to do that step by step, gradual. You can change the risk nature of a portfolio, but we never ever kind of sell everything or, 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 or buy, then go back to 100, uh, because then you, you risk that you have the wrong timing and then it, very, it, takes very, it might take very long to recover from that. So 
I would really recommend to do that, not in that extreme way, selling everything, but rather reducing the exposure uh, based on your risk capacity and risk willingness. Have you tried chat GDP? GDP for forecasting inflation. Uh, actually, I, I know I have tried it for different other things, but not for forecasting inflation. Um, maybe I should do that. Maybe the SMB should do that. Um, but my guess is, well, oh, well, probably ChatGPT is not worse than the SMB in forecasting inflation, but probably also not much better because in the end, um, AI is comes down to the to the to the data you feed in to the existing experiences, you can tweak that, uh, but you, you can be sure those guys at the S&B, um, they are very well educated, very smart, very good statistic uh, econometricians. They know what they're doing, but our ability to forecast inflation um, for a given point in time exactly is very limited, and I, I would be surprised um, if ChatGPT will solve that problem. But never say never. We should try it. Maybe, but it could could be interesting. Next week, the Swiss National Bank is is um, is publishing the, um, the new inflation forecast. Maybe you should try in advance ChatGPT. Uh, maybe do your own forecast, and then uh, look the, at the S&P forecast and compare it for the next three years, and see who's the winner, or who's the worst for forecaster. Less, for, less, less, less bad, so to say. Um, oh, another question to the SMB. Do you expect more rate hikes from the SMB? A short answer, yes. Um, most likely next week another one. Probably then one more. But also here, our, our ability to really forecast it um, is limited. That is more, things can change. You know, like it depends on very much on the incoming data um, and on the development but the, based on what we know today, based on the signals we get from the S&B, uh, we have to expect that they are not done yet, meaning that we, we most likely see another rate hike, hike, hike next week. Uh, on the positive side, uh, inflation is much lower already and always has been in Switzerland compared to the, the Eurozone or the United States. So the overall pressure for the S&B to do, let's say, as much as the, S, uh, the, the ECB or the Fed is not not there, um, so the S&P most likely doesn't have to go to 5%. I think that would be a bit of a tough one to swallow for the real estate market in Switzerland anyways. So, just checking. No, no more questions then. Thank you very much for, for dialing in, for joining. Um, I wish you great summer holidays. I hope you were not discouraged by by the inflation rates, by the prices of the hotel or the camper or by the flights or by the train ticket or by uh, uh, car prices. Um, but yeah, um, and uh, I hope you found, a, found something um, open still because if you look at Portugal, Spain, Italy, uh, there's a lot of demand for vacation there. Um, if you are lucky to got something nice, enjoy it. I uh, wish you all the best and um, looking forward to talk to you next time in person or at our next live stream. Take care. Bye. Yep.